Director Ben Lawrence and producer Gabriel Shipton. So I would love to make this uh, interactive conversation. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about for this film. We'd like to hear from you. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe we could start off, um, Ben and Gabriel, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, what's developed since the film has been concluded and, you know, just to, just to catch us up to, to, to today. Um, yeah, so, I mean, J Julian's situation, uh, you know, is, is essentially the same. He's in Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison, uh, fighting his extradition to the US. Uh, there was a high court, uh, the high court ruled in favour of the US and, and Pretty Patel, the Home Secretary, signed off on his extradition um, and said that he could be extradited, and that was in June 17. And... Uh, now he has lodged a, a final appeal, his final chance in the High Court or in the UK courts, and uh, we're waiting on a decision from the High Court whether they'll uh, accept that appeal application or not. Um, but, uh, you know, this legal proceeding, like Stella says in the film, it's this, and, and Nils Meltzer as well, it's this sort of never-ending legal proceeding, and the whole time Julian is in this, what Nils Meltzer calls this sort of uh, you know, he's suffering psychological torture, essentially, and, and his situation hasn't changed uh, since Meltzer and, and the experts that he took to the prison found that he was suffering the effects of psychological torture. So I was talking to uh, an environmental lawyer, Stephen Donziger, yesterday, and he, he phrased it in a very interesting way. He said, you know, the judicial system is sort of being used as a laundromat, you know, to, to, to clean up this... Pro persecution uh, and and give and wash it so it's sort of acceptable uh, to the public um, and uh, that's the way I sort of see the legal proceeding proceeding now it's it's to keep Julian there to keep him in this torturous uh, situation sure. yeah. okay. um, questions if you have questions please raise your hands uh, we can start right here with you I'm sorry could you repeat well, it's just uh, it's up to the high court judges now. So um, they've got the U.S. Uh, DOJ did a reply, and that was due in on the thirty-first. And um, now it's up to the judges on on when they want to hand down their decision of whether they, you know, what what appeal points they will hear or whether they will uh, reject the appeal entirely. Uh, so, but yeah, I expect that to happen before the end of the year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Since uh, Julian has, throughout this period that he's been incarcerated, he really has not been able to do his work. And as the opening quote in the film uh, makes clear, by example, when you torture people, uh, you affect others. And so uh, your verdict, you know, probably other journalists are not doing their job. Uh, and. So during that same period, what is the important work that the journalists of the world have not been doing about the things that are most important and mo kept where the deepest secrets are that need to be exposed? What kind of different world would we perhaps be having if our journalists and Julian have been able to do their work in all these years that he's been incarcerated? Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind picking up on that. It's it's a it's a fantastic point. I know traveling around with the film, and and obviously we started making in 2020, so it's been a, a two year process. But that's so true. Journalists around the world, particularly national security journalists, um, look at Julian's experience, and um, I, I think there's been a real pullback on on the clarity of reporting. There's a real concern around their own prosecution. You know, that's in Western countries, but the fact that the US are doing it. China, Russia, other countries look at that and they think, well, that gives me carte blanche to do that as well. So it doesn't matter where you are a journalist, the fact that Julian's held there and the longer he's held there, he's held there as an example. Anyone who wants to report, particularly on national security, um, they're thinking twice. You know, how they do it um, is uh, a different matter. You know, you, you look at, you know, we've just seen the end of the Afghan war. It's 20 years, you know. Uh, what Julian published, WikiLeaks published, what a whole bunch of their partner organisations published. Um, we were able to see on, on what happened in that, the Guantanamo Bay uh, files, the prisoners, and also the Iraq war uh, reports as well. 
Um, you know, maybe if uh, we will continue to see what else is happening around the world if, if Julian's persecution, prosecution hadn't continued. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just want to say one thing on that. Everyone's weaponising information. All the political parties are doing it. All the corporations are doing it. And we're all the ones that are suffering. And I think organisations like WikiLeaks uh, and their charter, what their manifesto set out to do was really bring truthful information that was backed up in a kind of scientific matter and, and publish original documents. So I think the need for journalists, you know, publishing that sort of truthful information is in such dire need today. Um, and what, what governments around the world are able to do on either side of politics and what corporations are able to do now uh, is really murking the waters and it's really hard to see a bit of clarity in all of it. So I think that, you know, we, what WikiLeaks, we, you know, they're dearly needed. Any other organisation like that is really dearly needed at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh -huh. I kind of have a question. I just want to make one statement because there was one part of the movie that was, it just struck me in, in a way, and it's when your father... Um, said that what he wanted to do was to give love and it seemed that it was something that was very difficult for him to figure out and it dawned on me that that's what Julian is trying to do for all of us is give us such a significant I mean, love I never looked at it that way I thought it was truth and I don't know if that's what you were going for but that's how it struck me yeah, I mean, with both Julian and Case and John's, you know, they're neurodiverse. They have a particular way of looking at the world and trying to understand it. And I think the interaction with other humans is, you know, particularly challenging, uh, you know, particularly being on the autism spectrum. And that was jo what John was trying to explain. But, I, uh, you know, I think there's, a, there's an element to that. Uh, their relationship to the world is, 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 you know, another perspective, another particular perspective as well. I also want to say something else, and I do want to ask you a question, because I think the situation is so incredibly desperate, and I feel a lot, and I mean, perhaps we all do, but really, do you think there's any alternative then for people to start to be willing to be arrested for this cause? And do you have any other ideas that actually individuals could do to try at this time to save Julian? Yeah, well, I th you know, at, as we've traveled, you know, all over the world over the last three years, and as we go from place to place, we see uh, we see this worldwide movement, you know, building, and we can see, uh, you know, there's now parliaments. Every European Parliament now has a Julian Assange group in it, a group of parliamentarians who are calling for Julian's freedom because of what it means to their people, and and they're reporting on on these sorts of issues. Even we have world leaders now, so you know uh, the Australian Prime Minister has said enough's enough, and he doesn't see what purposes served of Julian being in prison. You've got uh, the Mexican Prime Minister who's uh, made a statement. You've got the Vice Pres President of Argentina who's calling for Julian's freedom. You've got the uh, new President of Colombia, Petro, calling for Julian's freedom. Uh, Boric in Chile uh, calling for Julian's freedom. So there are world leaders all around the world who are, who are, who are calling for his freedom and there's this sort of wave, uh, this growing wave of, of people um, because these leaders and these politicians they just represent us, like the, we elect them, uh, but they represent millions and millions of people. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Berlin and on, on, the, on the steps of the Reichstag, we had 40, 41 uh, parliamentarians there, all you know, holding up signs, free Julian Assange, and that's millions of Germans. Uh, they represent millions of Germans. So, you know, I think there is part of this, this wave, it, it is growing, um, and there is things people can do here uh, there's a, there's we, we're taking there's um, some activists here uh, outside uh, you can sign up to the mailing list and there's actions happening all the time around the country um, there's uh, you know uh, protests outside embassies uh, protests outside the DOJ there was a huge protest outside the DOJ on the 8th of October with you know great speakers from across the spectrum you know ex-military 
uh, journalists, human rights activists. So it really is a growing movement. And I suggest, yeah, you take some of the flyers, take some newspapers, um, sign up to the list to find out what's going on and get involved. Thank you. Um, you, you, you sit right behind you. Yeah, go ahead. So w what's the point of fighting extradition? I mean, the Brits are not going to let them go anyway, right? They're just going to file the U.S. lead anyway. So well, he, he can stay in Balmash forever, right, technically speaking? Yeah, I, gu I guess, you know, the what we've seen and what the expert witnesses' uh, testimony has found and why the extradition was originally rejected at the magistrate's level uh, was the expert testimony said that Julian would likely die if he was extradited here. You know, we saw uh, there were elements within the sec national security apparatus that actually want Julian dead. Uh, so that's the sort of situation that Julian faces if he's extradited. Right. Well, if he is not, he uh, is in a prison, in a maximum security prison, but we still have a fighting chance. So we are still fighting to stop the extradition. I think hope is very important in this situation. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, are American news organizations doing enough, in your view, to help Assange? And what, would, what do you say to the sort of still lingering accusations that he is a puppet of the Russian regime? Um, I would say there's pro look, the editorial boards of the major partners who uh, publish the information for which Julian's now being prosecuted, um, you know, that they, they've shown their support. Um, I think in showing solidarity with all journalists who are imprisoned around the world, um, you know, publications can always do more. I think probably the diminishing power of the media um, and, and other powers taking advantage of that becomes more difficult for them. Um, but, you know, this is a fight where they could probably centre their focus and show solidarity with, with Julian because once this falls, I mean, th this whole country is built on the idea of the First Amendment. You know, the whole reason we can have these festivals and the reason we can have these discussions is because freedom of speech is, is held up above everything else here. Um, and this battle says that what Julian's been charged with is receiving, possessing and publishing classified information. Now, publications do that all the time in the US. But that is a crime. That is a crime. And so they can choose to use that whenever they like. They haven't been able to yet. But if they do, there's a precedent set. And so I think, you know, focusing the idea that this needs to be protected is really important in this country and around the world because it sends a message as well. And so I think organisations, other media organisations can do more, can always do more. But it's at a critical time that uh, that's recognised as well. Yeah, and just on, I mean, this Ru Russian puppet stuff is just complete bullshit, to be honest. Um, and it's a distraction. It's a total distraction. You know, it's to distract people from the actual principles, the actual principles that are at stake in this case. Uh, like Niels Melzer said in the film, you know, Julian turned the spotlight uh, on the Bush administration uh, the the crimes of a of a of the Iraq War an illegal war that was, um, you know the the WMD lie that everybody was told, Julian exposed all of that exposed you know the war in Afghanistan and how that was being run, and they decided to instead of you know turn the spotlight on him and and that is part of that those sort of bullshit smears and and things like that that's that's part of that. Uh, that work to, um, you know, dehumanise Julian and turn him into something, something else, and and make us forget, you know, what's really at stake here. You know, it's our right to know, our right to know uh, what our governments do in our name. I'll just say one more thing on that point because I want to thank Joe Laurie because he reminded me of a, an article that was uh, leaked uh, from the uh, Pentagon. It was a kind of a, a cyber security assessment on how to handle WikiLeaks. Two thousand and eight was published. It's a thirty-two page document. And basically, it was tactics to try and assess how they were going to respond to the rise of WikiLeaks and the information that was being published and able to get out to the public. And one of the solutions was legal prosecution, obviously, which Obama decided not to, because otherwise then all the other publications, all the other media outlets uh, would have had to follow suit and they would have had to be prosecuted as well. But the other idea in there was an unrelenting campaign of reputational destruction upon WikiLeaks, upon Julian, and upon anyone who associated with him. 
So think about that. If you had that written about you by the Pentagon, we need to, do, to undertake an unrelenting campaign against your reputation. So what does that say about their tactics? This is 2008 this was written. The, you know, the, the budget of the Pentagon, they could, they could sh shift 300 people aside to work on that for the next 20 years, you know, or the rest of Julian's life, and we would never know. It's those sort of publications how we understand how power works. And I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's really important to understand that when we think about uh, those accusations as well. Okay, we just have time for one more question, so I'm going to go with you right there. Yeah. Yeah, it was back in, uh, so it was in 2019 when Julian was, uh, had just been taken into uh, Belmarsh Maximum Security. Uh, he was, I went to see him with, with John and, and a journalist, John Pilger, and he was, I'd never seen him like that before, you know, throughout all the years he'd been in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, under house arrest, uh, I'd, I'd never seen him uh, in a state like that. He was being kept in the in the health wing of the prison, uh, which the prisoners actually call the hell wing, and kept in his, you know, uh, solitary confinement essentially. Uh, and I left the prison that day thinking uh, that I might not see Julian again. And, and that's when uh, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a film producer, I usually produce uh, scripted drama films. Uh, so that's when we started to think about, uh, you know, making a film, uh, making a film about the Julian that we know, uh, about, uh, you know, this gentle genius, um, you know, this family man uh, who loves his children and loves his family, and, and how do we do that? And, and at the time, you know, because Julian's in prison, so, you know, how do we get to know Julian? And so at the time, John was travelling around, um, travelling around Europe advocating for Julian, so it seemed obvious to start, start following John, and, and we did that for about six months or so and then then Stella who had been Julian's secret family uh, her name was about to be revealed in some court documents and she uh, decided to take control of that and, and that's that first interview we see in the film with um, that BBC journalist and and so we started following her as well and tracking her and following that journey, and so yeah, the, it it evolved over time. You know, it's real life; it's not a script. So, uh, yeah, we we started following um, Stella and John, and uh, that sort of you know became a dual uh, a dual sort of protagonist story. Um, I could shout out to Niels Ladefog here, who is our uh, amazing cinematographer, who. captured all those brilliant moments, um, all those uh, very personal moments um, that you saw, you saw in the film. Um, but yeah, we shot and we shot and, and it wasn't until Ben, uh, Ben Lawrence, one day I called Ben and we'd, we started chatting about the film and we're on the p same page, you know, from the very beginning and, and, and it's really when, uh, you know, Ben came on board as the director and, and uh, did all those amazing interviews that you see with John that sort of thre uh, are the thread of the film and really took control of the story um, and made it what it is with our editor, Karen Johnson. Ben, Gabriel, thank you so much for sharing the film with us and coming to share it. Thank you. With us. Thank you. Before, before we finish up, I, I just want to say if you thank, I don't get an opportunity to thank people, but there's, Neil's uh, acted like a co-director, really. I, mean, I haven't had a chance to thank him like that, but really uh, he's, a, he's a Danish journalist and filmmaker and, and we really made it all together. It was a wonderful team. Uh, to all the supporters here, I know there's some people in the audience who um, help financially within the film. I want to thank Randy Credico, who, if he isn't a national treasure, he should already be. Um, and, you know, anyone who's kind of helped us along the way. So I think Alexandra Nikolchev is here, who she, she filmed some of the New York sequence as well. Uh, and anyone else have I forgotten. So thank you all for coming tonight. And I'll just, can I just, sorry, Jake, can I just add... Um, there's a QR code thing on your way out. There's a um, audience award for this uh, festival. So please vote. I think you can give us five stars. Um, that would be the best. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and please put your email down. If you do one thing uh, today, just put your email down as on your way out. 
um, and you can get uh, updates uh, of what's going on around the place. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jay.